Hey everyone, it's Jamie Batts, your instructor for a and 2. We are going to start our chapter on the respiratory system. This section is going to cover the respiratory anatomy, and then in the following section we will cover the respiratory physiology, more complex. Um, this is pretty straightforward. It's, it's really just memorization at this point. So let me switch to screen share. I always mess this up. Here we go. All right, we're going to start all the way up here. And all right. Um, so overall organization and function of our respiratory system. First, um, it's composed of specialized structures that are involved in ventilation. Um, we say that it is um, pulmonary ventilation or breathing, right? Um, this is the actual air being exchanged from the environment into the lungs and then the actual gas exchange that takes place within the lungs between the lung capillaries and the blood. The respiratory tract is the, just the passageway bringing the air down into the lungs from the um, external environment. So that's our respiratory tract. Um, there are really two parts of our respiratory system. There is the conducting portion. The conducting portion is the upper um, part of our respiratory tract. This is where the air comes in and is basically directed down into the deeper levels of our respiratory tract. So um, nasal cavity, parts of the mouth, back of the throat, um, and then the upper tracheal regions down into the larger bronchioles. Um, and then the respiratory portion is the second part. This is where um, the smaller branches of those bronchioles branch off, and this is where gas exchange occurs in the alveoli. Now, those are all obviously new terms. We're going to take a closer look at these as we go through this chapter and this section. So, um, first, let's define some of the functions of that upper respiratory system. The upper respiratory system is anything from the epiglottis up. The epiglottis is a structure in your um, throat. Um, in the larynx region. So this is, um, the ba basic idea here is that you're warming the air as it comes in. Now on a hot day, obviously that doesn't matter, but on a cold day, if you're outside, that cold air coming into your 98.6 degree body is quite a shock. So one of the jobs of your upper respiratory system is to warm that air. The other function is to humidify that air, to get it a little bit moist, because that air is going down into that very delicate capillary area um, within the alveoli, and exchange is going to take place. And so that air, if it's too dry, it's not going to, um, first, it's not going to dissolve very well in that alveoli lining. And second of all, it's, again, going to be very abrasive to your lower respiratory tract. So warming and humidifying are very important um, functions of our upper respiratory system. One of the other things that it, it does, um, it's not listed on this slide, I was just looking for it, is it uh, kind of stirs the air around. If you remember those bony structures, uh, you have your um, internal, external um, meatus uh, of your, I'm sorry, the middle, superior middle and inferior concha, they form a meatus, as, as we'll see. Um, when we get into uh, further structures, but those concha, which were the bony structures, they're lined with with respiratory epithelium, olfactory epithelium, and when that air comes in, it can kind of swirl around within those passageways. And as it does, not only is it being warmed and humidified, but all of the dust and debris that you're breathing in is going to be trapped within that mucosa. So it's the upper respiratory tract is warming, humidifying, as well as filtering the air before it comes in. It can also help to reabsorb the heat and water as that air is exhaled. I'm drinking tea tonight. It's a, a late night in the office. I know you have no idea when and what and where, um, well, obviously where, but what time I'm doing these videos, but it's, it's rather late. Um, so let's take a look at this 
image here and you'll see the division between the upper and lower respiratory system, the epiglottis, which is this little lid-like structure. We'll take a closer look at it as we go. That is the division, our upper respiratory tract, nose, nasal cavity, the sinuses, the pharynx. Pharynx is a fancy word for throat. Then we get into the larynx structure at the epiglottis. Uh, that's where our uh, vocal cords are. And then we get into our trachea. See those tracheal rings? and the bronchi as they branch off into the right and left lungs. So the lower respiratory system or lower respiratory tract is moving that air um, to the specific sites where gas exchange occurs. Gas exchange happens in the capillaries of the lungs. They're called alveolar capillaries. And so the whole function of this lower respiratory system is to push that air and move that air deep down inside. So, and here's just a, a closer look at these structures. You have your larynx, which includes your epiglottis, the trachea, which is that air tube, the primary bronchi, which branch off into the um, primary bronchioles, your secondary and tertiary bronchioles, and then the smallest bronchioles, uh, which branch into the alveoli, which are these little kind of like flowery structures. We'll take a closer look at these as we go. So. Uh, overall functions of our respiratory system here in this diagram. Surface area for gas exchange. There's something like four football fields. I forget. I used to know the statistic off the top of my head. I think it's four. It might be five uh, football fields worth of surface area in your lungs for gas exchange. That's crazy. Huge amount of surface area in there to allow for gas exchange between the air and the circulating blood that's coming through the pulmonary circulation. Right, Moving air to and from the exchange surfaces um, is one of the functions of our upper respiratory system. Also protection, protection from dehydration. That's why the air comes in is um, humidified, temperature changes, any other environmental um, variations, as well as many invaders or dust or debris that's trying to sneak in um, through the upper respiratory tract. Our respiratory system is also important in producing sounds. That's how you're hearing me because of the vocal cords in my Larynx. It's also fun it's also functioning for our sense of smell. So it's kind of the it's almost a forgotten function of the respiratory system because we think respiration we automatically go to breathing and, and we think about all of those structures. But the sense of smell is one of the functions of our respiratory system because um, that is obviously within our nasal cavity. You can pause the video here, go back and answer these three questions. We're going to keep chugging along in this section of uh, respiratory anatomy. So let's talk about the respiratory defense system that's put in place. It's basically a series of filters. Uh, these filters are put in place to capture any dust, debris, or pathogens that are trying to get into the body. It also helps to protect the um, gas exchange surfaces from anything that has already been inhaled. So this includes special cells and structures within the conducting portion of our respiratory tract, uh, which is lined with respiratory mucosa. That's like the inner lining of your nose, right? And the, and the um, kind of back of your throat has that mucosa. It is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelia, um, and it has a lamina propria of areolar connective tissue, and that is what's there to support the respiratory epithelium. So in our upper respiratory system, you have special glands for secretion scattered throughout the epithelium. This is, I'm veering from the slide here, just so you know. Um, so in the upper respiratory system, amongst that epithelium, there are special glands for secretion to help keep those surfaces moist and allow them to um, secrete the substances which will help track trap pathogens and debris as well as to help humidify that air as it comes into the body. So the mucous membrane that is lining the inside of our nose is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. But then as we go through the back of the throat um, and the um, kind of boundary of our larynx, the epithelium is no longer um, columnar, it is now stratified squamous, and that's because it's a shared epithelia with the digestive tract, right? So you have all that food going down into the esophagus, and so the pseudostratified ciliated columnar is not functional there. It's, 
and there's a lot of friction going on with all the food that's being swallowed, so it's better for that tissue to be stratified squamous instead. So in the lower respiratory tract, um, in that area, you have a, um, an increasing amount of smooth muscle within that lamina propria, within that deeper layer of the tissue. So there's more smooth muscle. This is going to allow for that constriction and dilation that's being dictated by the medulla oblongata and our respiratory centers. Um, we're going to switch back to pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Then as we get down into the deeper bronchi, it switches the tissue, the epithelial tissue switches to cuboidal epithelium. And then once we get to the alveolar capillaries, it is simple squamous. So here's what I think you should do with that information that I just spit at you that wasn't on this slide. I think you should make a flow chart or some type of diagram, reverse the video, pause it, go back, and see if you can trace the different epithelial linings through the digestive or through the respiratory tract. So we started with the pseudostratified ciliated columnar and then we ended with simple squamous. How did we get there? It changed a couple of times. Make sure you map it out, make sure you know where the different tissues are, as well as make sure you understand the lamina appropriate or that deeper layer, what is it made of. So, as I mentioned, those mucous glands that are within that upper respiratory um, lamina propria are there to provide a sticky mucus to help trap that dirt and debris. There's also um, some mucous glands as we go down into the trachea, and the um, mucus is actually swept with that pseudostratified pseudo ciliated columnar. It's kind of swept back up into the throat region, um, which kind of sounds weird, but if you can imagine breathing in some of this debris, right, it's not captured by the nose, it gets swallowed somehow, and it gets into the trachea. Well, in the trachea, we have that ciliated columnar epithelium that's going to be producing mucus because of these special mucus glands, and some of that dirt and debris, the majority of it, is gonna be captured by this mucus on its way down into your bronchioles. So with that said, you're, you now have these globs of mucus sitting in your trachea holding a bunch of dust. What, is your, what, what are your cells going to do with that? Well, it pushes them up, right? Wants to get rid of them. Can't go down. It's just going to get stuck in the lungs. So these cilia are beating in an upward motion in a term that I think is kind of cool. It's called a mucus elevator. Hey, yeah, right? Mucus elevator. And that mucus elevator pushes the mucus with, that contains this junk back up into your throat, right? That's that hockey and a loogie, right? That's a <clears throat> that phlegm that you get in the back of your throat. You can thank your mucus elevator for that or escalator. In the other book that I taught from, it called it a mucus elevator. This book calls it a mucus escalator. I mean, I don't know the technical difference. That's one's pushing a button and one's riding a set of stairs. I guess escalators may be a little bit more accurate. There they are in this diagram. You can see these cells of our upper uh, trachea region uh, beating back and forth with that cilia after it had captured the, the dirt or debris. You can see those mucus cells, those little uh, yellow fatty things in there secreting mucus. As that mucus is capturing the pathogens or debris, it's sweeping them on up in the mucus escalator, not an elevator. Um, I don't know what term I used on your test or quiz. Either way, I don't think it should confuse you, right? It, the idea is it's going up, just like an escalator or an elevator. Um, so we already talked a little bit about this, so I'm going to breeze through it. The epithelia of our respiratory tract varies along the way. The respiratory mucosa lining the nasal cavity and the upper portions of our pharynx. It also lines portions of our lower respiratory tract. We have stratified squamous in there within our pharynx in the back of our throat, and that's because we share that region with the digestive system. And then the simple squamous is on our gas exchange surfaces. So this is very, very thin lining cells. These capillaries are very thin to allow for that gas exchange. So this chart here, so if you didn't do what I said already, here's the answer for you. Um, but make sure that you understand how the tissues change 
throughout the, di um, the respiratory system. Let's talk for a second about cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is actually uh, the most common lethal inherited disorder or disease among Northern European and Caucasians, basically among white people. This is the number one genetic disease that's inherited. One in 2,500 births, which still isn't that common, um, but it's common enough that maybe you know somebody that has cystic fibrosis. Um, basically, what cystic fibrosis is, is that um, people with cystic fibrosis produce a very thick and sticky mucus in the respiratory tract. Um, and this is obviously going to impact respiration, blocking smaller passageways, um, and it allows for, um, because that mucus kind of hangs out, pathogens can settle down there and multiply and cause infections. So the median age um, is, or age of survival is around the, the mid-30s. So um, obviously uh, having all of this mucus build up in your respiratory system is going to impact your quality of life and length of life. Typically death is resulting from heart failure because of all of the lung infections that go on. Very sad. A lot of nebulizing treatments, very frequent infections. Um, I taught middle school a while back and I had a student that had cystic fibrosis and I always wonder about her. Her name was Rachel. Um, but she was out all the time, um, as a seventh grader because of complications with CF. So, and if you are a white person like I am in the United States, you, and you get pregnant, you will probably get a genetic test done to see if you're a carrier for cystic fibrosis. And if the test comes back positive, then you're baby daddy, your husband, or whoever, will also get tested to see if they are a carrier for cystic fibrosis. And if you are both carriers for cystic fibrosis, um, you will then have a 25% chance of passing that, uh, or of, of having a child with cystic fibrosis. So you'll go through genetic counseling um, to learn more about that, if that's the case. You can pause the video here and go back and answer these three questions. We're going to keep plugging along in this little section. We'll start by talking about the nose and our upper respiratory system. So this is obviously the primary passageway for air coming into our respiratory system. In, during quiet or resting breathing, you should be breathing through your nose. Um, you have the bridge of your nose, which is formed by the nasal bones themselves, and then that is supported by the um, anterior portion of the nasal septum, and then you also have your hyaline cartilage, which extends past those nasal bones. The external nares are your nostrils. They open um, to, into the nasal cavity, and then the nasal cartilages are very small elastic cartilages that extend the bridge of ears. These are your little nose flaps. They help to keep your nostrils open, right? So there you can see what I'm talking about. Nasal cartilages, you have extra cartilage on the side and on the end, and then the bridge of your nose is where the bones are. You can pretty much feel, at least on my nose you can, I have a pretty big honker. You can feel those bones and, and then where it switches to cartilage, it's a little more squishy. The paranasal sinuses are actually contained within the bones um, that form the lateral and superior walls of the nasal cavity. So they're in this general area, the maxillary, frontal, ethmoid, and sphenoid bones kind of inside your head. Mucus is basically secreted by these sinuses to help clean the uh, nasal cavity and keep it moist. The nasal cavity itself has an extensive network within its lamina propria to help release heat when the warm air is inhaled. There's also water from the mucus that's going to help um, humidify that inhaled air by evaporating. The air moves from the nasal cavity into the lungs, um, and it's heated to body temperature by the time it gets down to the lungs, and it's nearly saturated with water vapor by the time it gets into the lungs as well. So it's a nice um, transition from the external of cold, dry environment into the body, unless you're living in a rainforest or something um, where your nasal cavity doesn't have to work quite as hard. And then the reverse process happens during exhalation, reabsorbing heat, reabsorbing water, reducing heat loss, reducing water loss to the environment, trying to maintain um, homeostasis. So overall structures of our nasal cavity of the septum, which is the uh, wall in between your two 
um, nostrils, right? It's formed by something called the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone and the vomer. It's the fusion of those two bones right there. Makes the little wall in the middle of your nose, dividing the nasal cavity into right and left portions. And then the meatuses are passageways. The superior, the middle, and the inferior are corresponding with the nasal concha. The concha, if you remember, were little curly Q-shaped bones. Well, when they curled, let me see if I can do it with my hand. They kind of curled like this, right inside your nose, obviously much, much smaller. And this passageway in that little curl is the meatus. If you remember your bone terminology, a meatus is a hole or a passageway. And that's exactly what these um, superior, middle, and inferior meatuses are. Um, they're just the pathways through those concha. And that swirling that happens as the air passes through is going to help trap more air particles, and it's also going to increase the amount of time that air spends in the nasal cavity so that it can get warmed and humidified. This is also allowing your olfactory receptors or sense receptors to really get a taste, so to speak, of the air, the chemicals that are in the air that are coming into your body. So it's assisting with the sense of smell too. This is a really cool frontal section. Um, so you can see these concha, and then the meatuses are this little passageways on through those little areas. Kind of kind of cool. Look how big the tongue is, right? It's a crazy, crazy section. Mm. You can see the sinuses here too, that open area within the bones. Pretty interesting. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, other structures of our upper respiratory system include the pharynx. Pharynx is the fancy word for throat. Um, this is a shared area by the respiratory and digestive systems, and there's three regions. The nasopharynx is the uppermost or superior most portion of the pharynx. It's just behind um, or dorsal to, you could say, just behind our nasal cavity. This has the nasopharyngeal meatus, which is where that auditory tube or eustachian tube enters from the middle ear for pressure equalization drainage of the inner ear. Uh, you also have the oropharynx. This is the portion of the, the um, pharynx that's just behind the mouth between the soft palate and the base of the tongue. That's what you see when you look in the back. This is stratified squamous. And then the laryngeal pharynx is deeper. It's right between the hyoid bone and the larynx. Your internal nares are the connection where the nasal cavity opens into the nasal pharynx. So this is on the back side. Your external nares are right here. Right? I'm picking my external nares. The internal nares is the opening of these, the right and left sides of the nasal cavity into that nasal pharynx. And the nasal vestibule is just the space within the nasal cavity. It's flexible um, in there. There's hairs in there to help um, uh, basically trap any airborne par particles, get them from entering um, in deeper into the body. Other structures of our upper respiratory system, our hard palate is the bony floor of the nasal cavity. The soft palate is the fleshy portion that extends past the hard palate. The glottis is the actual hole or opening to the larynx. The larynx surrounds and protects the glottis and the trachea is the tube that extends inferior to the larynx and conducts air toward the lungs. Here you see these structures. You can see the nasal cavity, the internal nares or the opening into the nasopharynx, then we have the oropharynx and our laryngeal pharynx. The nasopharyngeal meatus or um, the auditory canal or the eustachian tube, it's all the same thing. It's the tube that's coming in from the inner ear. Um, it's actually the middle ear, I should say. Uh, the middle ear going down into the back of the throat or the nasopharynx specifically. Oops, I need to click that. Uh, the hard and soft palate you can see here. The glottis is the hole. Um, and the epiglottis is this lid that is extending above. And this is what closes. You can almost feel it if you pay attention when you swallow. The little lid comes down and what you're swallowing is going behind the trachea down into the esophagus and not into the trachea, which would be pretty, pretty tragic if every time you swallowed it did that. Uh, you can, actually I'm gonna stop the video here, that way we can chunk this little portion a little bit better. Stop screen sharing. And we'll be back in this next video to continue on with this section of the chapter. See ya.